any one of us can go in our minds, think of a thing that does not exist, and then mm. bring that into existence. That to me indicates there's something extra going on. By high school, I had just been fed up with the school system. I was certain I would die a non-mathematical person. The set of problems that physics will limit itself to will eventually be solved, and then the only questions that will be left will be the questions that are typically of the metaphysical domain. If the CIA is experimenting with this, then there might be something to it and in terms of consciousness. We don't know what the hell this thing is. Exactly. We're just yeah. using it. You can use the flashlight to examine everything in the room, but you can't examine the flashlight. You won't catch me walking around Skinwalker Ranch at <laughs> night because don't test life. There's just so much weird stuff going on in what we call normal that we really are doing ourselves a disservice and blocking off things is too weird to entertain. This is why we're here right now. It's yeah. synchronicity. <laughs> it's the universe. Albert and Lorenzo, bring it out. Bring it out into the world. I'm like, okay, okay. Welcome everyone to another brand new episode of Noetic Nomads. I'm Albert Kim, the Sense Making Spaces unofficial game show host. And with me today is a fellow host, one of the inter-intellectual variety, and goddamn does he personify that title. As a musician with a natural gift in language who claimed he hated math for over 15 years, he started following his curiosity starting in 2017 and metamorphosized from an audio engineer into a computer programmer and full stack developer in less than a year. What? But his transformation wasn't complete as his interest expanded data science and analysis and even pure mathematics and physics to the point where he now hosts salons dedicated to the nature of time and the foundational cracks within the discipline of physics itself has co-founded the Olympia Academy, a community of fellow autodidact physics enthusiasts and runs a journal which had my head spinning as I read entries on everyday topics like, you know, Hilbert space, gauge theory and quantum teleportation. Nomads, please help me in introducing a writer, producer, facilitator, programmer, mathematician, physicist, systems thinker, and all around polymathic badass to whom I'm grateful for helping me realize just how much of a lazy dumbass I've been. Coming out of Stumptown, who could I be talking about other than the one and only Lorenzo Evans? Welcome everyone to another brand new episode of Noetic Nomads. I'm Albert Kim, the Sense Making Spaces unofficial game show host. And with me today is a fellow host, one of the inter-intellectual variety, and goddamn does he personify that title. As a musician with a natural gift in language who claimed he hated math for over 15 years, he started following his curiosity starting in 2017 and metamorphosized from an audio engineer into a computer programmer and full stack developer in less than a year. What? But his transformation wasn't complete as interest expanded data science and analysis and even pure mathematics and physics to the point where he now hosts salons dedicated to the nature of time and the foundational cracks within the discipline of physics itself has co-founded the Olympia Academy, a community of fellow autodidact physics enthusiasts and runs a journal which had my head spinning as I read entries on everyday topics like, you know, Hilbert space, gauge theory and quantum teleportation. Nomads, please help me in introducing a writer, producer, facilitator, programmer, mathematician, physicist, systems thinker, and all around polymathic badass to whom I'm grateful for helping me realize just how much of a lazy dumbass I've been. Coming out of Stumptown, who could I be talking about other than the one and only Lorenzo Evans? Thank you so much for coming on today, Lorenzo. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I um, <laughs> I I don't know that I'm worthy of the all of the 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 kind words, but but thank you, thank you, uh, nonetheless. You are absolutely worthy, and this is why I love doing this show. Cause I'm like, you know, like, like a part of my whole, you know, thing of the, the reason that I started this, this Nordic Nomads, cause I want to like bring these, these amazing people on and like, you know, and see, look at their gifts and show them to themselves, to the whole world. Right. And just like, this is who we are. And I'm like, in Lorenzo, like, I didn't even, I was just like, you know, like the universe is telling me, oh, Lorenzo, let's invite Lorenzo on. Right. And then I'm like, okay. I'm, and you're like, good, let's do it. I'm like, yeah. And then I start researching into you. I'm like, oh my God. 
I'm like, what the hell, Lorenz? <laughs> I just, I just barely started uh, getting into it. So, I mean, I'm, I'm so uh, grateful that uh, you came on the show and that you could share some of these very interesting insights with our audience today. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for having me, and I'm, I'm excited to be here. This is a, this is a cool thing, and, and I think this, the, I guess you would call it the concept of the class of this kind of conversation is like very important, and as many of them um, as possible need to be had. So I'm, you know, I'm. I'm, I'm down just here, here to share between two minds, multiple minds, a lot more minds than two, actually. Mm, yeah, definitely. This is part of this collective sense-making project uh, that we're all part of. And uh, so I would like to talk about what just happened. So we're recording this on a Saturday. And this past Sunday, uh, Lorenzo and I and about like 40 plus other amazing, beautiful, smart people were part of this gathering called uh, the Next Generation of Sense Makers and Change Makers, where we had a lot of people from all of these different spaces. It was like a meta event where, uh, you know, we all gathered and talked and had fun and played games and discussed a lot of things. So I'm just wondering, like, uh, like, who, like, who did you talk to? Like, because like, I popped into the uh, the breakout room. So like, who did you talk to? Like, what kind of interesting things were brought up? Because I'm very curious as like uh, what you specifically uh, uh, encountered at the event oh geez there's 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 names and, and concepts flying around in my head now and i'm like do i do i reference people by twitter name or do i reference them by their real name and it's like <laughs> well oh, what if i get their here. twitter twitter name wrong but um yeah i know one of the one of the people goes by the name of cognizor uh there's maybe, yes, maybe yes. gray jason. yeah gray, uh yeah. jason um there was there was an artist i believe her name was Natasha, and I actually like mm. I looked at I looked at some of her artwork, and I was like, note to self, gotta buy some of that um, <laughs> extremely extremely amazing art. But like, yeah. I guess the 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 core of the event for me was just sort of like it was almost like intellectual speed friending, and mm. so like yes. the, realizing that I guess like the amount of people that are out there sort of fringe of like what's going on what can we do what change can we make um and you know how can we facilitate this it was like it was mind-blowing to see how wide it was and just how you know varied it was and you can have a conversation between me somebody who there was a painter an esotericist i would i think that would be a relatively you know accurate term and another person who was also like a, a, um, a musician um Mr. I believe his Instagram name is Mr. Master Sucks. I can't. Mr. Master, remember. yes, Gabriel. He was he was he's Gabriel. one of the guests. He was the yeah. last episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great guy. Extremely glad I met him. Exchanged some emails. Going to chop mm. it up with him because awesome. we just we we really clicked on the intersection of a lot of these concepts and the relationship that they have to hip hop and it's totally unexplored. Mm. But there's there's a lot of it. You know, we're conversation about. You know, does the concept of Zen exist in hip hop? Is that what we mean when we say chilling and kicking it? You know, if I'm going to go smoke a joint with my homies and chill, is that Zen? And then he raised the amazing question of, is that Zen or just sedation? And that's just, that was powerful because mm -hmm. on one hand, you can, you know, be genuinely meditatively relaxing, but on the other hand, you can just be shielding yourself from, you know, reality. So yeah. that great thing, <laughs> great thing. It was, it was great. Wow. Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, like, I'm so glad you brought that up because that is an excellent point. And again, like Gabriel, I love Gabriel. Like I found him through uh, Rebel Wisdom Circuit Community. He was the last episode. I mean, if you if you people haven't watched it, like it's an amazing. We roast the entire sense making space. Like I'm part of the sense making space, but we just destroyed everyone. I'm sorry, but it had to be done. You know, because just like yeah, yeah you know, it's like these things. Like you know, like we talked about. You know, like I, the game B thing. Like I showed you the game C video. Like. You know, it's not about like, it's not about hate. It's coming from a place of love. It's like, hey, you know, you know, we all have our little little bags and hangups. And it's, I just want to point you out, it's coming out of love. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, and I'm so glad that uh, you you enjoyed yourself and you connected with all these thinkers. And like, what I uh, want to do with that event, it was really about, like you said, like uh, like um, Raven, who was at the uh, event also, like at the STOA, uh, they, there used to be an event every Friday called Socratic uh, Speed Dating. It was like basically the same thing. Like, you know, um, it was just like, we would have all these people come in and then like, it was just like, bing, bing, bing. We'd go into breakout rooms and we have a prompt. It would be very much the same thing. And for this, uh, I reached out to people from the Stoa, Rebel Wisdom, um, 
uh, the uh, noetic nomads, the inter intellect, and that's what I would be very interested in uh, starting this conversation with. Basically, consider you as part of the inter intellect contingent, uh, and like, and I've uh, been to the events for the past couple months. I've really been enjoying them. So I'm just wondering, like, um, how did you discover the inter intellect, and like, and like, what was it that drew you to it? That's a that's a funny question. It's a it's a it's a bit of a um, somewhat of a long story, but basically, I had started moving into into tech and I had stumbled onto um, Lambda School and so I followed that Twitter account and the CEO Austin Allred and then one day he retweeted um, something that the founder of the inter intellect um, had had tweeted Anna and it was mm -hmm. like really funny so I I followed her and then there's just like this blank period of like a, a year where I'm like at Lambda learning, you know, learning how to code. And then there's the, the, the medium post that sort of like kicked the thing off. And so I, I read that and I was like, well, this is interesting. And I like the concept, but it seems to be um, a bit, a bit more local than, than digital. And this is, this is funny because this is like May, 2019. And so wow. I'm like, these people are like doing this somewhere in San Fran. I'm here in Columbus, Ohio, yeah. relocated to Portland later. But so I kept uh, an eye out for that though. Cause I was like, this is an interesting thing. And then, um, I think February 2020, there was like an open link to, to join the group. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and join and take the take take me a lurker seat and actually see what's see what's going on here. And it was like, this is a really vibrant and high quality community, you know, like mm -hmm. there's there's a, a certain like baseline level of, of respect and decency that that exists that's. I've I've only only really noticed that at at Lambda, and I think it's it's about like the the way the culture is baked from from jump. But moving forward, I was like, all right, well, this is interesting, and I was still kind of like very very busy with um, with tech things and sort sort of going into actually like the job search, and I ended up heading to Portland because some things just made that a much better. Um, a much better move it was the move to make and so mm. then i joined the the there's a salon for like the birthday of the inner intellect so like a year has has gone by and i haven't really quite interacted yet but in may i joined this and i'm like yeah so i there was a prompt question of like well, what would you what would you like to do in the community and i was just like you know i would like to interact more and you know just be involved and i didn't know how that was gonna work um and then like a week, not not a week, but like maybe three weeks, a month later, I was reading um, Sabina Hassenfelder, Felder's uh, mm, Lost in Math yeah. with Sekar and starting the the physics thing. So yeah, just a, a series of events over like the, the course of like a year in a year or two just kind of led to that. And yeah, now I'm now, yeah. now I'm here. And now you're here in front of me. Like I love, I love the the the, the, the synchronicity of, of all these stories. I always ask, and I'm like, oh, just like, oh, I heard that, and then like this, and like you were super early. My God, like, like freaking, like you were there, like when they were still like physical, right? Like I didn't even know about them. Like I only discovered them. Like the way I first heard of them is, of course, you know, the COVID hit, and then like, it's like, and it was a time where like Zoom it was. Everyone's just talking about, okay, everyone's on Zoom now. And it's just like, oh, Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. Oh, and they're having like, I, I noticed that like people having like these Zoom salons or sessions now, like, you know, and they're like, oh, and then like maybe in the spring or early summer, I heard about this inter intellect thing. I was like, oh, those are interesting topics, so, you know, and then like, but uh, I was more so into like rebel wisdom and the stoa. Uh, I, maybe we could get into that a little later. And then, but, but, you know, fast forward a few months and like, it was maybe September or something. Like I was, I was reading one of Peter Lindbergh's uh, journals. Uh, he's the steward of the stoa. And he mentioned, uh, and he mentioned the interintellect. I was like, oh yeah, the interintellect. I remember them. And then I clicked on it. I was like, Hmm, let me start going into there because this is right when I was starting Noetic Nomads. So I was like, hmm, this is like another community that like I could be a part of. And like, I don't know, like I had no idea what was going to happen. I was just like, but I was starting almost my own. Like I, I now see what Noetic Nomads is. It's almost like it's kind of like a meta community. Like it's like a community, but it's like, it's more so a meta community because what I'm doing is bring all these different communities together and kind of having everyone mingle. And it, it like, I, I embody that with my event this past Sunday, which is exactly that. So yeah, let's go back a little bit. So what, this is very, what I'm interested about. So what social group were you a part of in high school and how did that impact the choices you made in your life and career? I'm very curious. 
Oh shit. Oh, <laughs> oh shit. What am oh. I going to hear about? Ooh, I, what, uh, okay, so I was one of those, I was certainly um, a, a floater in terms of clicks in, in mm. high school. So I was tight, I was tight with a little bit of, with a little bit of everybody. But the truth is that I was kind of a holy terror. Like I was, a, I was a little bit of a troublemaker, uh, mm. maybe a, a lot of bit. So like, I just, I don't know, I didn't like arbitrary authority. I had already by high school, I had just been fed up with the school system. And so it's hard for me to express the lack of respect that I had for the institution of education as a whole. So mm-hmm. like when I was in high school, I was, I was, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. Uh, there's, um, there's a, a British podcaster named Lippy Lickshot and he was, he was talking about, he was like, man was in high school, man, like gal. So that was yeah. the thing. Number one, I was, I was, when I wasn't making music, I was, chasing girls or skateboarding or, or smoking smoking mm. weed i mean it was a lot of hijinks a lot of mischief but um yeah I, I don't think if you were to like see me at 17 you would be like yeah this guy's going that way because i was <laughs> i kicked it with some of the nerds and i was cool with them mm. and you know i always had a nerd streak but like i went through that phase in in high school where i was just like nah i'm i'm kicking it and enjoying life and i was also dedicated to being a musician not in the sense of like i'm going to be a musician i was like there are ways for me to financially support myself with my talents i do not need a degree for this because i've already taught myself and the music industry is one of those industries where it's got some bs but it can be interestingly meritocratic in the sense of if if your work is good your work is good getting that recognized is one thing so i just i didn't see much much use in it um, for me at the time mm. you know like so many parallels you talk about like you, you can't stand arbitrary authority and how you just rejected the schooling system like i almost i almost flunked out like like I hated everything. Like I had like a D average, like in like 11th grade. The only reason, look, look, I, I mean, like if people who have uh, listened to some of my previous episodes know this about me. The only reason I graduated high school be- was because I was locked up as a teenager. And in the, lo- in the lock up school, all you had to do was sit in class and do a couple problems. And then they would, they would just pass you on and like give you, and then that's how I got my diploma. That's the only reason. So I'm like, yeah, I completely mm-hmm. get that. And, and like, that's the thing. But it's not like I didn't love learning. I absolutely did. It was just the schooling system, that's the, the, the whole BS. And like when I was reading about your like, how you talked about you hated math for 15 years. I was like, oh, my God. I remember like I was like a class clown. Right. Which I'm sure people are not too mm-hmm. surprised by. And I would just say <laughs> stuff and I'm like, blah, blah. And they're like, shut up. Stop. Stop. And I remember that one day I was like, I, maybe it's like eighth grade or so. And I said something, whatever it was, you know, just my regular thing. And she took me outside and she was like, Albert, stop. You're not funny. I don't want to hear that anymore. And when she said, I'm not funny, that crushed me so bad. Cause that was me. That was like my, I was a class clown. I was voted. I was literally voted class clown in sixth grade. And she said, I, I stop it. You're not funny. And that just killed me. That killed my love for, for, for school. I mean, like, it was just so bad. So I completely understand like the, this thing, this thread. Talk about autodidacts. I mean, like, let, so let's go into it. How in the world, right? Did you go from hating mathematics, all this stuff, being, you know, an audio engineer to now where you're at, where you're into stuff like astrophysics and, and, and talking about like all this crazy stuff in journals. Like, how did we get to that journey is what I'm interested in. Yeah. When I started transitioning into tech, I guess the perspective I had was the software that people use to create music actually visually looked more complex to me than the the tools people use to create software. And so, because I had done audio engineering, I was comfortable with computers in a lay sense. And so I was like, well, if I can understand this technology where basically what I'm doing is manipulating audio, the shift to this other technology where what I'm doing is manipulating text Mm. shouldn't be that hard because I mean really to me they're a digital audio work digital audio workstation or integrated development environment are the same application but for two different mediums Mm. and so see it's it's complicated because at some point in this story I stumbled into uh, the cryptocurrency space and so there were a lot Ah. of things that were pushing me into tech and so there was that I had a network engineer slash pen test phase and so this is what got me dealing with like a little bit of binary, a little bit of um, octo mode, which is like a, a, a base eight system, I think, for changing permissions for files and directories on, on Linux. And so mm. it's basically slowly over 
the period prior to Lambda, I got a little bit more comfortable with, with numbers and, you know, just a little softened up a little bit. And then at Lambda, at some point, I discovered the programming language Haskell. And I was like, well, this is great. Like, I really like this. And so when I get like that about things, I just start really like digging under the hood because I'm like, the thing is actually not the thing. It's the composition of a large number of things. So I'm like, what is it that you put it all together and you get Haskell out? And so it's a very um, mathematical language because it's a pure functional language. And so it's based on the concept of the mathematical function. But basically to make it short, if you give a function the same value, it should do whatever the function is designated to do and give you the same so it should be deterministic. And, and so this basically snuck a lot of math into, into my, my learning and sort of somewhat mathematical things, you know, like logic and, and, and whatnot, propositional logic and um, mm, discrete yeah. mathematics. And so at some point it had snuck enough of this into me that like, I've, I, I found myself like deciding to do some math stuff on a Saturday. And then after like three hours, I looked up and it was like, I'd finally clocked it. Like I was a different person than I, than I was because like, this was the one thing that I was, I was certain I would die a non-mathematical person. Like I had just, I had made that decision. Like, and I had verbal things to lean into. Yeah. Haskell snuck a lot of math into me. And then mm. a couple months later, I was like, well, that was the, thing that was keeping me out of like physics like it, it was the math stuff but like if that's not an obstacle now and so I like I filed that away and then <clears throat> fast forward to me joining the inter intellect I randomly posted about my interest in learning this stuff and um Sagar reached out to me and then the it just we just kind of went from there and started reading and and putting together this thing. And interestingly, the Olympia Academy was the name of the, um, the channel in the inter intellect matter most. And so then we oh, moved to okay. discord, the channel wasn't saved, but we had already made the Twitter account. And so that's, we just shifted, you know, sort of HQ there. Gotcha. And so, yeah, yeah, you can really blame programming. <laughs> play well yeah thank you programming because i believe the first time that i actually came across you was on twitter i believe um anna retweeted your um article i believe on um on like time when you're preparing for your your time salon and i read that i was like oh my god this is so good because like i like i'm, I'm like you know i like physics i like chemistry i like that kind of stuff when i was in university like i specifically requested like above like i got a, a, a like a, a business and engineering degree but is so like you have to take basic you know physics and chemistry but i requested like the uh, for, for like like for like the actual like medical and like uh scientist branch i requested the higher level and i just love that stuff but like you just broke it down so beautifully and you're like i'm into all that and i was love you wanted to perdurantism and endurance and all that stuff because i love med metaphysics was probably my favorite course in university so i mean that's amazing and what, what i find awesome about really about that article and and what i read i'm like you you really are an excellent science communicator and this makes perfect sense because you're 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 you yourself are just coming into this space right now, you know, like as a complete outsider who said he hated math. So from that frame, you're like, okay, I hate math. I'm a beginner, but I'm really curious about this stuff. And then you 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 laid it out so clearly. So I mean, like, and when I found out that you didn't even come close to to, to getting into this stuff until a couple of years ago, I mean, I was just I was just blown away. So in a couple of years, I mean, like. I'm going to have like Lorenzo Evans, like, you know, the next Neil deGrasse Tyson, like, you know, having his own little YouTube show. I mean, because I'm like, I'm really interested in what you're getting into next. And like th this whole thing that we're talking about, right? Like what you're talking about, how you got into science and all this stuff and programming and intellect is all through portals, portals, like the, the side door. It's never linear. It's not a story ahead. And speaking of portals, um, let's talk about Eric and uh, Brett Weinstein and the Weinstein brothers, the work they're doing. And like, I was just curious, um, cause you, cause um, I was, uh, I, I forget how we got into it, but like, I was talking to you, like, you know, DMs about game B and stuff. And actually, I believe I was talking to you about game B during the uh, intellect salon on um, life 
uh, which is another interesting topic. So like, I was wondering like, so how did you get into like Eric Weinstein and Brett Weinstein and Game B? Like, and are you also familiar? How familiar are you with like the other scenes that I may be a part of like Rebel Wisdom and the Stella and whatnot? Yeah, I would, I mean, I'm aware that the Stoa um, exists and sort of like what, what they're into. I haven't quite interacted with that, um, with that particular uh, community heavily. I would say as far as Rebel Wisdom, I've watched um, a few videos. I've watched a few since making videos with Daniel Schmachtenberger. And that's mm, sort of yeah. just it's like really, really foundational. OK, this there's this city exists on the map. But I had found out about that. And also, I think uh, Jordan Hall is another individual who has ah, some vid Hall, videos yeah. that I've, I've watched that I, I really enjoy. But I found out about them sort of like by way of Eric and Brett Weinstein, uh, by way of Joe Rogan and the the interesting thing is is that he he's one of the people who um, and I think this is a, a mission of his but like he basically sort of presented a challenge on Lex Fridman uh, his his interview with one of his mm. interviews with him where he was like Lex says can you explain to me your new theory and he says I can't explain to you my new theory because you don't understand the modern physics and so mm. if you you want me to but he said something challenging though. He said, if you want to understand this, then put in the work to understand the, this, the modern physics, and then you can start understanding what I'm working on. And I was just like, he kind of said it like he felt like I wouldn't do it. And I was just like, yo, I'll do that. Like, don't, mm -hmm. I have a weird ultimatum dare challenge thing. And it's, it, sometimes it works really well. Sometimes it, it has got me you know, in trouble, but that's, that's where I, I sort of heard about these, these uh, communities and ideas from. And Particularly, he had a, a conversation with um, Daniel about sort of game being, you know, mm, yeah. what it is, what it isn't, and will it work, will it, will it not? And you know, I think it's one of the best options we have for a, a new like program for for civilization. I think there are other options, but I don't know if they've coalesced into a term or a concept yet. So mm. I can't quite. Yeah point them point them out but yeah that's kind of how i i stumbled into that I definitely i'm aware of have watched and listen to all that content and like i need like i got into game b again during this whole pandemic because like of course i had known about um eric weinstein and brett and dan schmachtenberger for years because of his uh Neur neurohacker collective went into the neutro nootropics but like i didn't get into it until now but like i got into it like maybe five months ago I went deep into it, kind of like what you did with you, with your own, like all your different exploits. It got to the point where I actually released a response video to Game B where I just like criticized the hell out of it. And it got put up on like, you know, this like big, like integral stage uh, um, channel on, it's called Game C, which is kind of like a meta game between Game B and Game A, because it's, it seems to me kind of like, and actually we, we were chatting a bit about this. It just, like, I mean, like me personally, I just believe Game B, uh, the framework, it, it, it's very... It's very limited. They t it is, I guess, utopian in a sense because they're like, okay, we're going to be anti-rivalrous. Uh, we're going to have, you know, this, that. But like, what a great point that you brought up, which I thought was brilliant because, again, I'm into health and nutrition biohacking, is that you talked about the horm like hormetic adaptation from the stresses from rivalry can actually lead to like a, a more efficient system. So like, I just thought like that was brilliant. And again, like the, the difficulty of like the Dunbar and I and the physical substrate is like how are we going to get past this? It's like, you know, it's like physical resources are going to be rivalrous, you know, unless we just become like, I don't know, electromagnetic waves. And like, <laughs> actually that goes into your journal, your learning journal. And like, first of all, I mean, like the, the range of topics on there is incredible, but like near the end of my research into it, like I saw actually the reason why you even started in the first place is because it was like how you were learning about quantum computing which is, I don't know if that's still accurate. And like, that's like your, your next thing. Yes, yeah, so I'm just very curious. Like, what are you getting into right now? Like, cause you just, you just keep going. Like, I'm just really interested. The quantum computing thing was the result of a conversation I had with someone who's, who's a research engineer. And they were like, look, if you, if you want to dabble in this space, quantum computing would probably be the best method. And it's something that I had experimented with and looked at before. 
Mm. But um, I was basically like, you know what, I'm going to settle down and do this because really it offers me a way to travel in the direction of physics and, and research without having to basically start from scratch and leverage some of my understanding of programming. And so uh, what I'm, I guess, studying really right now is linear algebra with uh, Gilbert Strang's lecture videos and his book, which I have a PDF of, but also want a physical copy. That's basically kind of how I got there. And I just decided, well, why not, you know, make something that I can present publicly. And it also will allow me to not just like keep track of my notes, but I can put my articles there. I can put my thoughts there, my reviews or reads of, of, of papers and, and whatnot, and just make it a resource for, for people. I'm studying linear linear algebra right now and also having a, a bit of a, a tangent into scientific philosophy with mm -hmm. the uh, Stripe Press's Scientific uh, Freedom, which an inner intellect Anton is hosting yeah, some, yeah. Um, a series of salons on that, which are, are great and then there's the art of doing science and engineering. I probably just butchered Richard Hamming's um, book title, but yeah, basically a lot of books that are not just about science, but about the perspectives and the methods and the psychology that one brings into these things, because they're just very key in what the resulting science looks like. Mm. Yeah. And like, yeah, you started bringing about, uh, I started talking about science and kind of like the meta view and uh, what I was I found very interesting. You brought up uh, an imminent metaphysics by Force Landry. I mean, this is big and like uh, uh, Force Landry, a Game B member, right? And he's actually has a sense maker in residence series at the Stoa. Every week he's like, he's giving his own little thing and people come in and talk with him, asking questions. So, I mean, yeah, so like, I like that. And then you're, you just keep expanding. I don't know where you're going to go with next with the, with this whole thing. Philosophy is my love. I don't know. Like, are, are you like, you think like maybe you're going to start branching out into like the more philosophical realms or even like, maybe, I don't know, like think about like, I don't know, like remote viewing or, or like uh, like maybe intersubjective uh, collective presencing into the field. I don't know if you're curious about that or you see yourself going that road. Well, yeah, I'm definitely going, going to consume a, a decent amount of, of philosophy. And I, I find metaphysics interesting because I don't, there's a sort of thought experiment that I have in my head where at a certain point, I think, the, the set of problems that physics will limit itself to will eventually be solved. And then the only questions that will be left will be the questions that are typically of the metaphysical domain. Mm, but if you think about yeah. the advancement the advancement of, of science at some point, I feel like there's this sort of blurry area where we certain things we won't know if they're um, really relegated to metaphysics um, until physics takes a serious attempt at solving them and it doesn't want to because these things aren't so it's, it's a ch weird chicken and egg sort of thing that that happens happens there but um, so yeah I'm very interested in, in metaphysics and it's interesting you you brought up remote uh, remote viewing because like I, I definitely like all of the conspiracies and sort of uh, mm, yeah. esotericism mystic mysticism ah. what is consciousness what can it do and so there's it's one of those things I don't take like necessarily a hard stance on because of the curse of imperfect knowledge but mm. on one hand the idea of remote viewing is obviously like physically implausible like that's not how it works and then on the other hand, you have this weird occurrence where CIA documents of yeah, them I know. attempting to find out if this is possible leak. And so what I have to do is say, if the CIA is experimenting with this, then there might be something to it. And also in terms of consciousness, we don't know what the hell this thing is. Exactly. We're just yeah. using it. Mm. But of course it might, there's, you also have to worry about disinformation because yeah. the CIA is totally the kind of organization that will compile some information about research that was never done and push that out into public mediums to mm. keep us off of the trail of whatever the hell they're actually yeah. up to. So mm. I, I, you know, I try to keep softly held opinions, but I have this weird thing about me where like everything that science will deny because of how implausible it is None of those things are really as implausible, are more implausible than everyday things. Like mm. all of all of this is entirely strange. I don't know if people really <laughs> appreciate the fact yes. that 
we've got this we've got this thing in our chest it's just running on its own it goes in and out in and out in and out and we don't control that and then there's also there's that thing in the sky we call it the sun it is a giant ball of um extremely intense nuclear processes but it emits this this radiation that hits this gigantic water rock seven minutes away and now there are plants and animals like every everything that is going on is so entirely weird to me yes, when you think yeah. about it that like nothing is too weird to rule out like it i mean you if you have a principle or uh, you know as a scientist you you want to be plausible or something you know certainly you can use a heuristic to whittle down the 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 haystack but generally i mean who's to say really what's too weird to to entertain Mm, yeah, I'm absolutely with you. I, I wake up every day. I'm like, what the hell is going on? It's, it's like, what the hell is this? You know, it's, it, you know, it just like, and it's just like, I guess that's why I'm so weird. Like I'm weird because I find all of this weird because normal is weird to me. So it's like, it's like weird is weird. It's like, you know, it just, it just, it just like, you know, folds back on itself and like, and I am not surprised you have that that viewpoint. And I love it because again, like, I, you know, I was, I was reading through your stuff and you're like, in order for like, you know, for physicists and just science in general, if we're going to actually, you know, make quote unquote progress or anything, we got to be open to the fact that like, all of this is foul. Like we have no idea what's going on. And like, you know, it's, and it's like it's stuff like this, that's holding back these disciplines. And like uh, uh, your first uh, inter-intellect salon was about uh, specifically on, was it Sabina Hassenfeld, uh, Hassenfeld, sorry if I butchered that, on like, you know, getting lost in the beauty of math and how, that's holding back physics. So I just wanted to get into it because I know that, that, that this is something that you're interested in is like, and it's just crazy that you just got into it, but already you're poking holes. It's very much like with me, with like what Game B, I was like, Game B, you like, what the hell is this? And it's like, you just got in, you already talked about it. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. Like, what is what is up with the science? What is up with physics? Like, what what are they not getting? And I, and I also, as a, as a side point, if you have a take on this, what are your thoughts on the theories of everything? Like, they just coming out, out the woodwork, like Weinstein, Lee Smolin, uh, Steve Wolfram. They're just coming out the woodwork. There's like, it will like, what is up with that yeah i'm just wondering your take on that well so i will preface this with um out of respect for the people who have put long hard hours into understand the field is that i have not learned physics yet and i mean truly one never finishes learning physics mm -hmm. but like i'm still figuring my way around this but also just as a person who thinks and observes and and reflects well certainly the biggest issue i think in in physics is the lack of room for for new ideas and so like i like i was mentioning before with the game b thing stress and rivalry can be hormetic it can actually push the 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 system to a higher state a better mm -hmm. state and this is also the the argument one of the arguments that paul fire robin makes in in his book against method is that counter induction the if you have a, a theory that's uh, that's standard presenting a theory that contradicts it can allow you to see where that theory is is flawed and, mm, and this yeah. this process played out many times in science and has led to some of the the new theories that that we have that we you know describe the world that we that we live in um another thing that i think is is interesting is you know we heap a lot on the academics and and that space for you know the the sort of strictness in the in the dogma but i also think there's a socioeconomic problem where people who could be scientists and mathematicians and physicists and philosophers and all of that don't get there and so i think this mm -hmm. is yeah. this is a a a a leak that we don't realize because you know, it's like if you don't miss money that never hit your account, but it was it could have hit your account. And so there's this thing where you don't know what you what you don't have. And so that's really, really a, a problem with um with not not even just physics, but like all of the the major fields. If you want to think about like stagnation, why why aren't things moving and growing as fast as tech is? I think part of it is there aren't enough minds in them mm -hmm. offering new I new ideas. Um, they, you know, there's they have their own difficulties, you know, like medicine has its own difficulty that's totally going to be different from, from doing science because, you know, there are some things that that entails that, you know, physics doesn't people's lives aren't on the line if you if you if you do bad calculus. 
Well, you know, in this in this tech driven world, not bad calculus, but you got to be careful about your logic is what I'll say. As far as, as theories of everything, woo, that's a bit above my pay grade. I pretty much above everyone's pay grade. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I appreciate like sort of, I can at least give you sort of what my basic understanding is, is that mm. the problem that theories of everything are, are trying to solve is that Einstein's general relativity is a classical theory that obeys by the rules of classical mechanics is deterministic and reversible mm. that tells us that gravity is the result of curved space time and everything that has um, mass will curve space time. Cool. Perfect. Then you have quantum theory, which says that everything is fundamentally composed of these quantities that are not deterministic or probabilistic in terms of their placements in space, wh where they are on the X, Y, and Z axis. Mm. And so I didn't figure this out myself. I got it from a Sabine or Hassenfelder video where she basically said, if you have an electron that can be in one or two or three or four places, if the location of it is deterministic until you make a measurement about where it is, where is the gravity because this mm, thing has mass yeah. and thus it has gravity, but where is the gravity if the thing that is curving space-time to generate it is probabil probabilistically located? Mm. And so I'm not mad at them because that's pretty damned weird where, you know, I'm like, okay, I see why this gets under the skin of a physicist. I can't really offer any opinions on any of the theories of everything themselves, except for I know that Stephen Wolfram's um, theory basically presents the universe is resulted from something called a hypergraph. And this is a very, very complex graph, a graph where a node could be a graph in itself. And I personally think graphs are extremely, extremely powerful and important structures. And so I do like that about his, his theory. I started reading some of the um, technical documentation and also the idea that the complex reality that we inhabit could be built up by repetitive um, applications of relatively simple transformational rules on mm, relatively yeah. simple things. I think that, that, you know, makes makes a lot of sense. People people harp on him a lot for his, you know, the cellular uh, uh, automaton thing. And yeah. they're like, well, that's Conway's thing. But like, nonetheless, I think there is something really, really interesting about about that. And also, if you look at like the the the... I can't remember the math for the, the Mandelbrot fractal. I think Z and C are the only variables in the in the equation. I think C is there twice, but like it's a really, really simple thing. But from it, you get extremely complex, lush, detailed things. And so, mm. yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> that's pretty amazing. You're like, this is about my pay grade, but you're like, oh, I'm looking at, uh, you know, Wolfram's uh, theory. I was like, Whoosh. I didn't even come close to looking at it. I just, you know, I just like, listen to smart people like you talk about it. I'm like, oh, okay, that kind of makes sense. So yeah, I mean, like, so I'm so glad to have you on. And so we talked about like uh, quantum physics and like like how all the interpretations and like, I mean, th this is something I'm uh, interested about because uh, again, I believe uh, we both attended the last uh, Origin of Life Salon at Interintellect, which was my favorite Interintellect Salon I've been to. That was so amazing. I mean, it, just the conversation we had was just sprawling and all over the place. And uh, one of the things that I, I, I don't know if, I know I brought it up. We talk about the origin of life. Like, like, what is it? We're talking about like one of the biggest questions you could ask. How did all this start? And I brought like, you know what? We're talking about like, like certain interpretations of quantum mechanics, of course, coming from a lay person. Consciousness is primary to the universe. And somehow and you could even say that in panpsychist view that like everything has some, uh, you know, element of consciousness in it. And that perhaps like, it, we, like consciousness was what it kind of like, you know, brought life into being in order to, I don't, to, 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 to like, I don't know, like exert some sort of agency on the, on, on the universe or something like that. So I'm just curious if, do you have any thoughts on like specific interpretations of quantum mechanics and with life or consciousness in general? I know it's a big topic. Um, so I, I will say there's sort of a set of interpretations, uh, which is the, the psi ontic and the psi epistemic. And I'm going to mm. super duper duper simplify this because I haven't even fully unpacked it for myself. But what you can do in short is that the psi ontic perspective believes that the wave function, which is the equation that will allow you to derive the probability of, of, of an observable, mm. 
actually exist. This is just what it is. And then there's the sci epistemic approach, which is that it's an explanation or representation of something that mm. um, exists, yeah. but we don't know what that is. And me, I personally feel like there's just more going on, but I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm sci epistemic even necessarily from because of like a physics thing. I just think reality is way too complicated for us to have cracked the code and hit the bottom layer yet because there's so mm. many other things that are integral to reality, like time and consciousness that don't seem to really have answers or you know a reference that'll be found there. But it's a strange thing. Like this, the problem here is that like I'm actively crunching information on this, like throughout my days, trying to figure out exactly ah, what I think about the relationship between quantum um, mechanics and, and consciousness are. But I, I would probably bungle a lot of QM stuff up in trying to do that. So I hmm. will shuffle that off to the side and, and just say that my perspective on consciousness is I think were we to be able to really like say this is what consciousness is I think that would entail us opening a new sort of area of understanding like it's not just gonna be that this is what consciousness is it's gonna mm, be like this yeah. is what consciousness is but because of this we also know um x y um z you know these these things but like it's really a big mystery and I'm, i i just spend a lot of time thinking about the weirdness of it for instance one of the things that seems to be key is that consciousness isn't endowed with this creative force like any one of us can go in our minds think of a thing that does not exist and mm. then bring that into existence yeah and that to me indicates that there's something extra going on because generally you can't pull off that um, something from nothing process oh. in this reality and also consciousness is very information focused and, and this is just from my experience as a conscious being i am either consuming creating or observing some sort of information and so yeah kind of dodge dodge that that question there but as far as quant consciousness and qm but that's where i am on consciousness and i also think that the concept of information, I think it's it's not been defined for my to my satisfaction. Mm. I think information is key, but we don't know quite what it is. And it's the problem of consciousness being sort of trapped where it is in the scale of things, you know, like if you take a flashlight into a dark room, you can use the flashlight to examine everything in the room, but you can't examine the flashlight. And so that's sort of mm, the problem yeah, that I yeah. think consciousness has is it's the flashlight but it wants to observe itself in order to figure itself out. But obviously that doesn't quite work. Wow, Lorenzo, I love that. First of all, the fact that you didn't give a definitive answer is why you're so awesome. It's the epistemic humility, unlike some, you know, some other people who think they know it all. It's just like, that's exactly why you're able to do what you do. And you you brought up the flashlight metaphor, flashlight on itself. Cause like Evan McMullen, he just had a session at the Stoa. I love Evan, he's so brilliant. He's much like you. And he's doing a series, it's called um, The Bridge. And it's basically the bridge, like, cause, cause he, again, like you, he's like, he's like criticizing, you know, the, you know, the, the traditional like scientific ortho orthodoxy, where it's like trying to define everything by the scientific method, and it's just not working. Like they're like, you know, like different knowledge quests, you know, like, and science is one knowledge quest, but it, something like Buddhism, it's his own separate knowledge quest, like religion, it, like these are actually their own separate knowledge quests, which which are valid within their own domain. And it's just like science and like scientism is trying to act like like these other knowledge quests of talking about like subjective experience and like like and consciousness, you know, just like a different like a, a separate magisterium that you can't use science to 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 really figure out consciousness. Like you have to dig in. And like what he's doing with the bridge is he's trying to like. I, like bridge the gap between the two. I'm not gonna say I understand it, but like he used a similar metaphor with like you you can't use the telescope to see the telescope. It's like you know you gotta you gotta have something to look back on it. So yeah, I mean that's I mean again amazing. I mean the, a lot of synchronicity. I definitely recommend you check it out. Actually, I'm gonna send you the link because what he's talking yeah, about. Yeah. yeah, 
what he's talking about is exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. And um, going further on that, uh, another thing, like, I, I, I'm just uh, getting into, like, you know, just some guilty pleasures right now. One thing that was brought up, and, like, this is one of the things that, that – that's, that's just, it's just so – it's just so curious about the weirdness of it all, right? Okay, we're at the origin of life thing, right? We're talking about, oh, where did this? Talk about panspermia or, or pan whatever, all these different things about where life started, how to get here. And like, and they're like, and and we're all like, we're all like, like talking under the assumption, right? As if like, there are not already intelligent beings out there and who have possibly been, who are possibly in contact with us right now. And I, I brought it up, I was like, okay, are we just gonna pretend like uh, like this whole Pentagon, New York Times leak of all these UFO sightings? Like, are we just gonna pretend like this doesn't exist in an origin of life thing to talk about in the universe? And, but there were also other like uh, uh, other people viewed, uh, brought up their own uh, uh, voice, their opinion. They're like, uh, there may be some sort of like underhanded thing going on. And we kind of mentioned about the CIA thing about the disinformation. Uh, so that could play into it. So I just wanna know your specific thoughts do you want to like? What are your thoughts on what the hell's going on with that? I'm just curious. What you, you know, what you think? So, the, interestingly, there's there's the thing with aliens also um, exists in in religion for me, and also with the supernatural or the paranormal, which is mm -hmm. once you have a number, such a large number of people saying they have this experience it's really illogical to say that they're all all wrong like it's the law of numbers just generally doesn't work that way like if you if you i'm not sure quite how to how to formalize this but at a certain point you have to assume that not only is someone genuinely trying to tell you what they think they experience but that's this is act that was actually the experience because the ufo thing is quite numerous and i, I grew up in a household where things like this things like this were, were often discussed and there was always oh, something really? on the tv about it and oh. so i've had a lot of a lot of exposure to it but i guess there are th three things for me one too many people have had this experience for there to not be something going on the universe is too vast for me to imagine that even on a small percentage of the places where life could crop up, a percentage of that life has has to have become intelligent because when we're we I think we truly underestimate the vastness of the universe, like yeah. the or the vastness of these these numbers, you know, something something like 10 to the 15. Like we're just like, that's a big number, but like, no, 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 no. This is a colossal number of uh, opportunities for um for life to um to to exist actually i'm not uh, three it's four points so the the third is that the, the ufo phenomenon seems to have kicked up when we started doing nuclear experiments mm, and yeah. quite frankly to me that it seems to make sense to me like uh, let's let's flip it on its head and say if we looked at um at pluto or we looked at another planet and we saw city lights we would say, hey, what's going on over there? Because mm -hmm. we know that that signal, that event indicates that there's someone controlling it. And if you think about a nuclear experiment and the way that this is gonna affect the fields that exist, the forces that exist in reality, this thing will send a, a, a signal that just travels throughout throughout space because it's a nuclear explosion. And then you mm -hmm. go, well, I, I genuinely i hate to uh, espouse this opinion but i think it's kind of a thing where like the aliens are the mature people and they're like all right let's make sure that the those that species over there isn't about to do some dumb shit with the the power <laughs> yeah, that they that they that they just unlocked yeah. because that's what that's what i would do if i was a civilization and all of a sudden i just got um, a signal of a large number of nuclear explosions um, happening at, at some point. And then the fourth thing for me is that there's a really, really eer eerie occurrence where um, aliens and these these sort of structures or spaceships, whatever you want to call them, they show up in a lot of religious paintings. And yeah, so yeah. that and that goes into the into a, a aspect on the um, origin of, of life as as we know perhaps it was engineered. And I mean, again, mm -hmm. it's you you said epistemic humility. I mean, who am I to say that this this isn't feasible? But 
Um, and then small caveat point is that I've seen some of these videos mm. and I understand the machinery that we have that we're capable of. These things are extremely not that. I don't want to say it defies the laws of physics, but our understanding of the laws of physics do not allow us to um, operate at that. So we haven't figured out the, the trick yet. Mm. But you know, and perhaps it's just technology that governments have and are sequestering, you know, for whatever reasons, they don't want civilization at large to know that they have it. But boy, oh boy, would that, that, that seems just really damned implausible to me because we're talking about technology that if, if you had the techno, if a government had the technology to generate the spacecraft that we see, they have the technology to do a lot of other things. Mm. Cannot imagine a government not doing if they're if they're that powerful, you know. Like there's, mm. it, it just it doesn't seem feasible. Mm. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Uh, plus one on that, Lorenzo. And like, I, I'm talking about like, I remember we brought, uh, we brought up like uh, Bob Lazar there. And like, I've watched uh, Co Jeremy Corbell's films. I've watched like all of like Nano Man, Patient 17, Hunt for the Skinwalker, talk about Skinwalker Ranch, all the crazy stuff happening there. I mean, like, I don't like that. Mm -mm. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. Like I said, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a open, open person. And so, cryptids cryptozoology that, that whole possibility like who am who am i to say no but i will I, and also there's this, a spiritual esoteric sort of thing that you know when we start to thinking about like the dimensions or planes in which these things yeah. exist where they come yeah. from all all i'm gonna say is that we don't know that they don't exist people have had some very very intense experiences with them and my whole thing is that like you won't catch me walking around skinwalker ranch at night because <laughs> no way, but. you definitely i mean it might just it might just be it might just be a pack of coyotes that gets me and you know that's one yeah. thing but like mm. I, my i have my friend has a, a phrase that he says don't test life don't yeah. test life because it will pass and now you have to grade that test and that's not fun. So, yeah, I mean, that again, there's just so much weird stuff going on in what we call normal that we really are doing ourselves a disservice and blocking off things is too weird to entertain. Mm, definitely. Wow. I love this conversation so much. Like, <laughs> just like, like well, this is this is why we're here right now. It's yeah. synchronicity. <laughs> it's the universe, the collective consciousness being like, Albert and Lorenzo, talk about <laughs> subjects, bring it out, bring it out into the world. I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> so like, again, thank you so much. And like, uh, I know you got to jet off. I know you guys, so you're really busy, but again, this has been an amazing conversation. So uh, a, a few quick little things. Um, I heard you talk about a uh, a bisque, a newt stack, a, a nootropic stack. Uh, I'm just curious what you're taking. Of course, you're super brainy, and I want to. I'm into nootropics. I'm into biohacking as well. So I'm like, what the hell is Lorenzo taking to get to his level? So I'm just curious about that. Um. Yeah. I, so aniracetam, oxiracetam, uh, the paracetam, fennel or not. Um, triacetyluridine is has been just putting me like on 250%. That's whoa, great. Whoa. Awesome. The, the, uh, the uh, daffodils, the daffodils, those are, those mm -hmm. are great, but you also, you got to get your natural stuff in. So you need your chaga mushrooms, you need your reishi, you need your cordyceps. Um, yeah. Is there anything else? Of course, the omega-3 fish oils, gotta, gotta have that, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. you know, uh, um, you gotta have a choline, a choline source, you know, so like, um, and then also one of the other nootropic things I do is like when I really need to focus, I'll throw on like some binaural beats and go wow. right up the gamma and yeah, you just turn yeah. that, turn that down just enough so that, it, you know, it's hitting the subconscious. You put your, your study music on over it and then you just, you're in the zone. If I remember, I'm probably, I'm not, go, go to a brain specialist for this, but I think the brain tries to match like these frequencies that it gets exposed to after mm. a certain time. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. That's how they, that's how they work. But, um, yeah yeah that's 
yeah there's that so yeah man yeah yeah uh yeah that was amazing because yeah again the, the, the racetams uh you talk about the, the, the drafting them but definitely like you know like i'm all up into that you know like lion's mane all this crazy stuff and like that's a great one that i missed i'm ashamed of myself lion's mane <laughs> will do people lion's mane will do so much for your mood man mm, it'll, it'll, it's so good yeah every day with my smoothie definitely but that tricetal uridine I'm getting, I'm getting on that people. Okay. Actually, you don't have to be like me and all crazy and like us, but like, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. I'll, I'll report back, but yeah, I'm definitely going to try that. And uh, one more thing. Uh, I, I'm a little interested. Well, maybe a couple more things. I mean, I want to get you out of here so you can get busy on your life. You tweeted about BTS, Bangtan, Sonyeondan, K-pop super group, the new Beatles. So, <laughs> so I was like, yes. Yeah, so, so you tweeted about them. Uh, so I'm just curious. Uh, what do you think about, I mean, obviously you're, you were super into music before, like, you know, it was in your career and it's your passion and stuff. What do you think about BTS? And like, you talked about this, but you didn't say who was, who is your bias? And what, what do you think about BTS, K-pop in general? Well, yeah, no, you know, I, I remember I sent that tweet and I was like, yo, who am I standing? I think somebody told me to stand Jungkook. So I think I might, I might, I might go, I might go with that, but like, yeah. I'm gonna be entirely honest for like m most of my life, K-pop was like, it was just like the annoying thing and not mm. necessarily because of K-pop, but it was like what the fans would do on Twitter. But I uh. noticed that oh, they used their power to sway some hashtags in, in, in support of some social issues. Mm. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta be cool with that. I, I, I respect that. I appreciate that. And so the other, the other thing, and I, I don't mean to, I'm, I'm going to get to the praise, trust me. The other thing that <laughs> no, scares me yeah. is that I don't, I know that the music industry, the media industry and the artist image and representation thing is, is I've heard some worrisome things and like, I just want mm. to let the artists be healthy because then yeah. you get better art from them. Mm. But now on to the praise. Yeah. First of all, I like, I like some of the swag that I see. Like I like, I like some of the threads that I see them boys in. Yeah. <laughs> I really, I really have to respect the way that they've taken the world by storm. And one of the the interesting things that I saw somebody point out was that it, it, there's a very positive sort of enthusiastic sort of upbeat aspect to their music in a time where this is not very popular in pop culture. And so mm, I think. Yeah that might be part of the reason that they're they're so uh, successful is that people want somewhere where they can just be doused in positivity the same mm. way they can be doused in negativity on the on the twitter uh timeline and so that's that and also i think them becoming like they i don't know if it was a, it was an award they won recently that was like or something they they got that was like really really big in american like music and media and i like the idea of other countries artists and musical creative culture breaking up this sort of hegemonic hold that america mm, yeah, does yeah. have on culture because i think that will help the culture of of, of of america just it could be expose yourself to more things guys but like yeah i i also have a feeling that like at some point in my future k-pop is going to be what i put on on like the, the weekend <laughs> the weekend afternoons cool. where i'm like let me get my energy and clean my clean myself together it's like you can't you can't really not have some energy about you when that stuff is mm. is playing so um yeah, yeah it's 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 good for the it's good for the world you yeah, know? I'm, yeah also it makes people really happy mm, people yeah. are really are like this it does a lot for them and so like i i'm, I'm glad that they have that so i'm glad that they're there yeah, I mean, yeah, I love that viewpoint. And I love that you brought out that, uh, you know, as, you know, as many positives as there are about K-pop, look, there, there's definitely a dark side. I'm fully aware of it. You talk about slave contracts and just, like people just being put through the grinder, just treating them as, you know, and uh, the superficiality. Like there are definitely some bad aspects, but I'm, I'm, I'm fully on board. And I noticed that as like, I listen to like uh listen to like the message from like Kate from like from like BTS to talk about love yourself like one of the themes they have like these things like love yourself and this and that and there's like positive things and then I go to like the YouTube trending and I see all the videos that are at the top I'm like oh my god like what the hell is this like I'm I, like I'm blown away I'm like I don't understand like do how do people not see this like of, of course people like us see this was like how the heck is this the, the, the it's, it's honestly like the worst possibly ever but like you got the <laughs> bts and just like wow and just like again so again like awesome and like 
this has been an amazing conversation. Lorenzo, I mean, like you're, I mean, first of all, I mean, I know you're a smart guy. You're into like, oh yeah, the, the, the article on, on time was great. And like, but then I'm like, oh my God, I dig into your work. And then I've got this conversation. I'm like, Lorenzo, he's the next Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'm just putting that out there into the universe. You know, we're going to see a lot from him. And I, I'm just really excited uh, to see what you do in the future. Cause I know this is not the end of your journey. So um, before we go, I mean, like, uh, uh, I just want to know, like, is there anything, any like books or thinkers, movie shows, anything that you'd like to recommend people check out? Cause I'm like, you're, I know you're into some interesting things. Anyone who hasn't watched um, Peaky Blinders needs to watch Peaky Blinders. Peaky That's an Blinders. amazing, it's an amazing series. Um, anyone who, who, it is a is a reader get this book the dream machine by uh mitchell waldrop it's it's a recent strike press release about you know mm. the, the thoughts and the ideas and the concepts that gave birth to computers but not just computers also those concepts and how they how they map on to the um to the future um yeah john wheeler's gian's black hole and quantum foam is wow. really really amazing um Against Method by Paul Fire Robin. That's that's a great one. Uh, when Einstein met Gold by Jim. My Jim God, Holt. I got. I've been I've been doing a lot of reading, man. There's there's some really oh the Scientific Freedom book. Yeah, no, I can do book recommendations for for days. Fam. Oh my uh, God, yeah. So yeah, so definitely I'm gonna put those in the show notes. And uh, Lorenzo, maybe if you go to hit me up after, I'll put I'll give it. You maybe you could have like a whole post on it. I don't know. Like I want to put this out there because again, like you, I know you're into all sorts of amazing ideas. I want to get this out there. So again, uh, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, where can people find out more about you? Like links, social media, uh, your blog. How can they find out more about the amazing Lorenzo Evans and his journey? Yeah, I'm um, I'm on Twitter at Oxel Dev Zero X L E D E V, and that's probably the the best place place to keep keep up with everything. Um, you guys will have to wait. It's a little secret, but that this journal that's being spoken of, I, I'm, I'm going to work mm -hmm. on getting getting that All right. yeah. tidied up a little bit more and release. And then also check out um, um, the Olympia Academy on on Twitter. That's T H E O L Y M P I A C A D. That'll get you there. I think that's that's about it. All right. All right, I'll put all those in the show notes. Uh, O0XLE Dev at Twitter and the Olympia CAD. And then his journal, I would love to have it out when we release this episode. I'm very excited about that and having people learn about all this amazing stuff that he's learning. Quantum computing, uh, the, you know, gauge theory, all that crazy stuff, quantum teleportation. I mean, hopefully <laughs> you see that out, uh, Lorenzo. And again, uh, I, I'm so grateful to have you on. This was such a pleasure. The fact that we talked about Skinwalker Ranch is just amazing. <laughs> and like All that stuff. I mean, like, I'm glad that I could bring that up because that's something that is really intriguing. So, again, uh, thank yeah, you know, so they, much. They scare the shit out of me, man. <laughs> I, um, but, yeah, no, this has been amazing. We're going to do more of these. This has been mm, uh, yeah, this has cool. been really, yeah. really great for, you know, for, for my day. And thank you for having me on and, and taking the time. And this, is, this, is, this has been really, uh, really delightful. Mm. Definitely. That is the word of delightful. Again, amazing. I mean, I'd love to, you know, connect more with you and have our audience connect with the great Lorenzo and whatever he's going to do in the future. So that's it, everybody. That's it for another episode of No Nomads. I hope to see you next time and peace out, everyone, and step up because the world needs you. Okay, bye. All right. And we are...